I am a uh, board certified nutrition specialist, athletic trainer, and strength conditioning coach. And I'm going to be talking to you guys today about overanalyzing keto um, and overthinking things. Um, so just a little overview about what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to go into kind of my journey, where I started with keto, how I got involved with it, and what I've learned kind of over the last few years. And then I'm going to go into the topic we're going to discuss today, which is analysis paralysis, and give you a little bit of feedback and just some tips for kind of pushing past it and overcoming it. So just there are going to be a few pictures of me and just my journey since 2014. So I was introduced to keto in 2014. Um, I was pursuing my master's degree in nutrition and exercise physiology from James Madison University. And uh, for our master's degree, it was a two-year program, we had to uh, go through a thesis study. So we had to pick a subject that was related to both nutrition and exercise and basically carry out a study looking at uh, nutritional intervention in an exercise population. And many of my classmates were doing um, like observational studies and uh, survey studies, and I knew that that wasn't something that would interest me for two years. Um, I knew I wanted to do something that was a little bit more exciting and a little bit more challenging. Um, so I, at that point, I had just joined a CrossFit gym, and I was, you know, just getting into CrossFit. I was loving the environment there, and so I knew that I wanted that to be my population, because my exercise population, because it was very, it was sort of new. People weren't really, didn't really know what CrossFit was. There wasn't that much research on it. Um, so I knew that was going to be my exercise population for the study, and so I had to pick a nutritional intervention. And so I went looking, you know, digging through the literature. I, at that point, I was pretty, like, paleo. That was kind of my eating style. And I knew that I had already kind of researched paleo. I was, you know, knew a lot about it, and I knew that I would, you know, that would stick my interest for the next two years. And so I came across the ketogenic diet. I don't remember exactly where I came across it, but it was in a research study, and I had heard of the Atkins diet, I'd heard, I'd heard of you know, ketoacidosis, but I never really heard of the ketogenic diet. So I dug a little, little deeper into the research and I wanted to learn more about it, so I ended up going on Google <laughs> and Amazon. I was just looking for a book to read that was related to keto. Um, so I found Jimmy Moore's book, Keto Clarity, um, ordered it on Amazon Prime, got it in like a day, and I read the book from front to back within probably 48 hours. Um, and this is actually a picture. I took a picture of the book and I remember myself taking a picture of the book right after I finished reading it because I was like sending it to people and I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Um, so I actually went back in my phone and I found, like I have thousands of pictures in my phone and I went back and this is the picture I took right when I finished reading the book in my grad school dorm thing. Um, <laughs> so I, read the book and I got super intrigued by, you know, everything, everything in it. I knew that this is what I wanted to study for the next two years. Um, this was back in, in 2015. So, so I went, you know, read it and I did some more research and then I kind of embarked on it myself. Um, and this, so the next picture is kind of showing you when I first started, this is Actually, they're, they're kind of bad pictures, but this is my first keto meal prep ever. Um, <laughs> And that was my first urine reading ever. <laughs> I took a picture of it, and, um, so I thought that would be fun to share. But um, I made, you know, a lot of mistakes myself. At this point, there wasn't really that much out there on keto. You know, it was not popular at all. Um, I definitely, you know, had no idea about electrolytes. I was lowering my calories too much for my activity level. Um, so I kind of went through this during the February, March. Um, and kind of made these mistakes for myself. And so when it came to pursuing the study, um, I kind of had those things in the back of my mind, knowing, you know, okay, I need to up my electrolytes, I need to make sure I'm getting enough food. Um, just these little things that I kind of tested for myself. And so the study I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Um, so I want, I'm not gonna go too deep into the study, I'm gonna give you guys just a little bit of the results. And then you guys can, you know, if you want, this is online, it's on my website. I um, mean, you can check it out. But the study was a, it was a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet combined with six weeks of CrossFit training improves body composition and performance. 
and we ended up getting it published in the International Journal of Sports and Exercise and Medicine. Um, so this study, the kind of hypothesis of this study when we were going into it, like I said, I had no idea about keto at the time, and even CrossFit, I was still very new to it. Um, so we kind of hypothesized, and, and the goal of the study too, I, I like to always say this, is that it was based more on uh, body fat loss and looking at it, could these participants lose a significant amount of body fat and weight while maintaining their performance. That was the hypothesis. So it wasn't based on looking at their performance, which is a lot of people get kind of confused. They hear CrossFit and they're like, oh, you can't do keto because performance, um, which we'll get into that. But just so you know, the overall study was more looking at the body composition changes. Um, so, and, and I always like to preface that this was in non-elite CrossFit athletes. So. If anybody, does anybody know anything about CrossFit? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? Okay. So a lot of people have heard, has everybody heard of CrossFit? Okay. So looking from the outside in, if you, you know, you see the CrossFit games and these like elite, crazy, like eight pack athletes and they, they're just like crazy <laughs> in a good way. Um, and they're at the CrossFit games and they're doing like 10 workouts a day and um, so that's like what a lot of people from the outside looking in see CrossFit, but if you actually go to your average CrossFit gym, like there's thousands of CrossFit gyms around the world, and you go into it, 95% of those people are your average Joe. Like everybody in this crowd, just your average mom, or just anybody looking to kind of get a good workout in, be in a family environment, and just have fun with it. They go maybe three or four times a week, um, and their ultimate goal is to just get healthy and maybe lose some, lose some weight. You know, a lot of people go to the gym for that um, as one of the goals. So I always like to preface that that these are non elite CrossFit athletes, which is 95% of the population in your average CrossFit gym right now. Um, so that was the study, and I'll just give you a little breakdown. It was a six week study, and we had uh, 32 participants, and we divided them randomly into two groups. So one group was following their standard diet, which was just the standard American diet, and the other group was following a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And so over those six weeks, um, well, before the study started, we did pre-test measurements. So we looked at their body composition using a DEXA scan, their weight, all of that. And then we also did a performance test. So we did a benchmark CrossFit workout for time, um, just to have that pre-test measurement. And then throughout the six weeks, um, we measured their ketones, we measured um, their food, what they were intaking, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and then at the end of the study, we did the same exact testing that we did at the beginning of the study to see what the differences were. And so this chart kind of breaks down the results of the body composition changes. So I'm going to kind of put this up here too. So if you see the blue, um, Oh, well, the red is the control group, CLN stands for control, and then blue is LCKD, which just stands for low carb ketogenic diet group. So over this six week period, at the end of the six weeks, the keto group was able to lose a significant amount of body weight, body fat, fat mass, while maintaining their lean body mass. Lean body mass. So lean body mass is basically everything else in your body that is not fat. So a lot of people hear lean body mass and they just think muscle, but it also encompasses your organs, your bones, all of that. Um, so over those six weeks, um, you can see, you can see by the picture of the drop in significance, and all of these were stati statistically significant drops. Um, and then you can see with the lean body mass, the low carb group lost a little bit, but it wasn't significant at all. Um, and then. Also, just to say this, this was the average percent change. So not everybody lost two and a half percent body fat, not, not everybody <coughs> lost almost eight pounds. That was kind of the average over the group, but it was still significant, as you can see. Um, so the study was super successful. Um, like I said, we got it published. And going into the study, again, like I had no idea what to expect because I was so new to all of this. And even my advisor, everybody was just like, like we had to run the results again and do all the analysis at the end because my advisor was like, wait, what, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, th these are legit results. Um, so after I graduated, I ended up presenting the research at the National Strength and Conditioning Association conference. 
Sorry, this picture is a little uh, dark. But at this conference, um, I presented it, and I actually met Ryan Lowry. He was he was the only person who actually asked a question after my presentation. <laughs> Everybody else was just sitting there. Um, but so we talked afterwards, and I became really close with him. And I actually ended up moving back to Florida. Um, I was in Virginia for grad school, so I moved back to Florida because I went to undergrad um, at the University of Miami. So I moved back there and I connected with Ryan. He was in Tampa doing a lot of research uh, with keto in that space. And again, this was in 2016. Um, so moved back to West Palm Beach. And at that point, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do like, with my career. Um, so I started working for jobs and I came across uh, a job with a supplement company. And I ended up working for uh, Ultimate Nutrition. I was their nutrition scientist, and I was formulating different supplements and doing research and kind of learning all about that. And at this point, I had kind of gotten a little bit away from keto, um, and then something sparked me again. I think it was something I went up and visited Ryan, and I saw the research he was doing, and I was just like, kind of lit a fire inside me. And so I decided to go, you know, straight back to keto. And I was doing this, and I was started posting pictures on my Instagram and of my food and all of that. And my friend was like, "You should just start your own like food Instagram." Um, so I ended up doing that, and this is actually my first post on my Killing Keto Instagram, um, and it's <coughs> me making bulletproof coffee. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people start that way, or at that time coming into keto, they're like, "Oh, bulletproof coffee, I should do that." Um, so this is my first post on Instagram and I started you know getting some followers and I started posting more and more. Um, and then I actually joined a CrossFit gym at when I was in Florida and they knew I was doing keto pretty strictly and, and this is when it started to gain some popularity. And so my uh, owner of the gym said why don't you put on a presentation and just tell people, you know, explain what keto is, talk about your study. Um, so that's what I did and it was we actually called it, uh, I, know, I don't know if any of you have seen these shirts around, but Keto and Tito's. So we figured, you know, the only way to get <laughs> some athletes and some regular people out, like CrossFit athletes out on a Friday night to listen to a uh, seminar, a <laughs> seminar was to offer them free alcohol. <laughs> so we came up with the name Keto and Tito's and uh, we made like a fun night out of it and I just presented on my results and told them what I was doing. Um, and so we created these shirts, and I started uh, handing them out to some of my friends. <laughs> um, probably recognize some of these people. Um, but at that, uh, at that seminar, after I finished presenting, everybody's like, okay, how can I start? Like, what do I do? Um, so we, we started talking, and we're like, let's put on a challenge. So um, we put on this 21-day challenge, and it was the best way to kind of introduce people to this because we were you know, with a bunch of people who were doing CrossFit and they were active and the best way was to challenge them and you know, get involved. So we, I put on a 21 day keto challenge for my gym and I actually had some other people involved. I had people, you know, my family started getting involved, I had my cousins from like across the country and we uh, created this Facebook group and just started, you know, it was like a virtual Facebook group and started talking in it and people were getting really, really good results just after the three weeks. Um, so it was a really good success and I kind of turned that into my own business. I ended up leaving the uh, job at Ultimate Nutrition and just moving to San Diego and kind of pursuing my own business, um, which is called Kill It Keto, which was my Instagram name that turned into a business. Um, and then the 20 Day Challenge actually turned into a book so I wrote that book, came out in September, and so I've been doing some online consulting and, and all of that. So that's kind of just my background, which I told you all that because it'll make sense <laughs> when I get to the second part of the presentation. Um, but yeah, so moved to San Diego, and this is kind of where I'm at now. And so just thinking back over the years, uh, there's a lot of kind of not noise, but I, I don't like to call it noise, but there's a lot of different concepts within the keto space that a lot of us kind of get tripped up on um, as we are getting deeper into it and you know, listening to what different people say, different opinions, all the science coming out. Um, and sometimes, and what I've noticed lately is there, there is a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but there is some negativity and some judgment for a lot of uh, 
different maybe areas of keto that people are following for themselves. And so I've noticed this a lot lately, and if, raise your hand if you've noticed any of this. <laughs> okay. So a lot of people are, you know, that's not keto, or this has been coming up a lot. <laughs> Has, raise your hand if you've noticed this at all. Yes. yes. Okay. So this is kind of what I've seen over the, you know, especially recently. And so I've kind of gone through when I was putting this presentation together. I kind of wanted to think about, okay, what are the, what are the most popular kind of topics or concepts that a lot of people get tripped up on, or they're, you know, one person says something, another person says the complete opposite, and it's just kind of confusing and you don't really know like who to listen to or what to believe. Um, so thinking back over the years from when I first started keto you know, to where I am now, and even for myself, what I've gotten tripped up on, what I've kind of experimented with, I thought of, well, originally it took me 10 of the, these concepts, but it ended up being 12. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna kind of go through those. And these are basically kind of concepts and topics that have a little bit of controversy behind them, and like I said, people get tripped up on. So the first one is just going back to bulletproof coffee. Um, I'm sure you've heard people that say, oh, you have like, bulletproof coffee, that's keto, like that's where you start, and that's where I started. Um, and then there's other people saying, no, like you shouldn't be consuming a bunch of fat in your coffee, don't do that. Um, so that's just like the first thing. The second thing is net, net carbs versus total carbs. You'll, you'll, you'll hear people say, you should be tracking total carbs. You should be tracking net carbs. And you're like, <coughs> what should I be tracking? Um, or things like, you know, should I be including sugar alcohols in my net carbs or fiber? Like, what, what is it? There's all these different, you know, people saying different things. Um, the next thing is protein. So I think about a year ago, a year and a half ago, there was a, a very big surge in, oh my gosh, protein is going to kick you out of ketosis. Like, gluconeogenesis is the devil and protein equals chocolate cake. I don't know if anybody's too weird there. I kind of went around for a while. Um, so that was another thing. It's like, oh, am I eating too much protein? Am I eating too, much, too little protein? Dairy is another big one. People say, oh, you can have as much dairy as you want. Or others are like, no, don't have any dairy. Sweeteners is a big controversy, mm -hmm. um, I think, <laughs> yeah. especially, especially now. Exogenous ketones, um, should I be consuming them? Should I not be consuming them? Are they, you know, legit? What are all the different kinds? This is just a few examples. And I'm not calling out any of these companies <laughs> or anything like that. I just need to show. I'm a very uh, picture person, if you can tell. I like visual pictures. And I'm just going to keep going. So, urine versus blood, for example, some people say, you know, you should be testing your ketones all the time. And some people say, you need to be testing blood, you can't be testing urine. Or some people say you shouldn't be you don't need to be testing your ketones. So what do you do? <laughs> Fasting. I think this is a big one. Um, a lot of people, if you're coming into keto and you're new to it, uh, and this and this these all these concepts concepts pertain to both people who have you know are new to the keto community and they're coming in, but then also like us people who've been in this for a while and even myself. Um, so I think that this pertains to everybody because there's always you know new research coming out, new opinions. All of that. So with fasting, there's a lot of, you know, should I be fasting every single day? How long should I be fasting? Do I need to be fasting to be considered, you know, keto or following a ketogenic diet? Macros. <laughs> should I be tracking my macros? <laughs> Carnivore. So this has been very popular lately. Should I be, you know, I've been keto for so long, should I be carnivore? Or I'm just coming into keto, should I go straight to carnivore? Carb ups. Uh, should I implement carbs into my, you know, protocol? Targeted keto, cyclical keto, all of these different concepts. Um, it's something that a lot of people get tripped up on. And, um, it can get very overwhelming with all of these things. And the last thing is, Recently, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, there's been this like clean keto versus lazy keto versus dirty keto, um, which, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that is just, it's confusing. Um, so 
all of these concepts kind of, especially for myself, um, over the years, I've hit many times this concept called analysis paralysis, um, which I'm gonna show you a little clip here, which really helped me understand it a little bit. Um, does anybody watch The Big Bang Theory? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, which, this. What? These instructions are a pictographic representation of the least imaginative way to assemble these components. This right here is why Sweden has no space program. <laughs> well, it, it looks pretty good in the store. Well, it is an inefficient design. For example, Penny has a flat screen TV, which means all the space behind it is wasted. We could put a stereo back there and control it out. Run an infrared repeater, photos out here, emitter here, easy peasy. <laughs> good point, how you gonna pull it? Hey guys, I got this. Yeah, hang on, Penny. How about fans here and here? Also, an efficient hand might be loud. How about liquid cool? Maybe a little burning. Guys, this is actually really simple. <laughs> Hold on, honey, minute work. Comes <laughs> <laughs> down here, maybe a little corrugated sheet metal as a radiator here. Oh, really? Show me where we put a drip tray, a sluice, and an overflow reservoir. And if water's involved, we're gonna have to ground the crap out of the thing. Guys, it's hot in here. I think I'll just take off all my clothes. <laughs> oh, I've got it. <laughs> what about if you replace panels A, B, and F and crossbar H with aircraft grade aluminum? Oh, right, then the entire thing will be heat sink. Perfect. No, 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 analysis paralysis, there's so many different opinions and concepts and it becomes the point where there's so much and then you end up being paralyzed by it and so instead of, you know, picking one, you're like, there's just so many and I'm just not even gonna, you know, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing or just not even try. Um, and so I think that's a huge uh, issue that's for new people who are coming into this space is there's, they can just Google something or go on social media and see all of these different Opinions, not that any of the opinions are wrong um, or anything's wrong, it's just there's so much and you become paralyzed by all of it. Uh, so this is just another way of kind of looking at it. This is the paradox of choice. They kind of go hand in hand. So you can see on the y-axis is happiness and on the <coughs> x-axis is choices. So it's good to have some choices, um, but when you start, you hit a point where there's just so many and it causes you to just get stressed out, you're not really sure which direction to turn, um, and you literally get paralyzed by it. Um, and I think the main issue that, or what I see this coming from, is mostly social media and all of the information that we are, we have nowadays. So like when I first got into keto, it was not big at all. Like there was nothing really on social media. There's there nobody out there yet, really. Um, and so I think nowadays there's just so much you can just go on Instagram or go on Facebook and you know you see someone promoting carnivore, not that's wrong, but you see all of these different things and it just gets overwhelming. So even for me going through like my you know years being in this space, I always tripped up on a lot of these these concepts, these twelve concepts as they you know came about, as they started you know the ebbs and flows that went with them. And so I came to a point where I was like, all right. I had clients coming to me who were very confused about a lot of things. I was confusing myself. Um, I was you know, experimenting with all these different things. And so I thought to myself, okay, what did I do you know, when I didn't know anything about keto? When I first came into it, what did I do? And so I thought back to my study and I said, okay, the, study, the people who went through the study, although it was only six weeks, it was still a success. Um, and these people learned a lot and they all had a lot of success. So I said, all right, let me just go back to what I did in that study and look at the parameters of that and kind of just start there. Uh, so I actually went back um, into the study and saw everything I did. I knew it in my head, but I was just kind of reviewing. Um, but just so I can show you guys, I actually found the um, slide that I presented to my thesis board before I even started the study and it was just a slide talking about the diet protocol that I was going to give the participants who were in the keto group. 
So this is all, all at once. So we had a mandatory dietary instruction session, session where I basically sat everybody down who was in the keto group and explained to them, um, just gave them a, a very basic background about what they would be doing. So I gave them a list of recommended foods, um, what to focus on consuming, and I told them to, my approach, even going into the side because I was coming from paleo, my approach was taking you know, a whole foods approach. So I told them, you know, eat, Whole foods as close to nature as possible, and at this point, it was it was kind of a blessing. Like there was no like keto packaged foods. The only thing was Atkins that was like around. Um, so a lot of people, and I and I said this like focus on consuming whole, you know, meats and veggies and healthy fats. So I gave them a list of recommended foods, and the guidance was to stay below 50 grams of total carbs. And I didn't require them to like track macros every single day. Some of them did. Um, but the only requirement was that every two, week, every two weeks throughout the study, they had to submit a three-day food log with two weekdays and one weekend, just because your weekdays and weekend um, eating can be different. Um, so they did that every two weeks. Um, and then we also tested urinary ketone assessments. So we tested their urine ketones once a week, um, both in both groups, to make sure that the control group wasn't producing ketones and, and that the keto group was. Um, and we did urine ketones because at that time uh, we didn't have the funding for blood. Um, but these were the basics. And also with, just to kind of, I, I miss this, but with the carbs, that was the, the main thing. Keep your carbs under 50 grams of total carbs per day. Um, and I kind of gave them, showed them kind of what that would look like in a sample meal plan. And we didn't focus on protein and fat. It was an ad limitum diet, which just meant eat until you're satisfied. Um, and let the protein and fat kind of fall where it is. Um, so that was, and then I obviously this diagram was kind of just a little a breakdown of what I showed them. So this was what I did for the study and what I told them, and they all had, and also electrolytes, sorry, I missed that. I told them because I had gone through that myself, so I just made sure that they were getting enough salt. It was just salt that I recommended for electrolytes. Um, so, kind of going through this, I realized, all right, the easiest way to, you know, if people are succumbing to this analysis paralysis is to just always go back to basics, no matter if you are starting from the beginning or you have been doing it for a while and you're just tripped up and overwhelmed by everything. The best thing, in my opinion, is to go back to basics, and this is where I always go if I'm ever, you know, tripped up or I'm doing a certain experiment and I'm just overwhelmed. Um, so these are just a few of my kind of tips, six, six of my tips for kind of just going back to basics and, um, you know, starting from basics. <laughs> uh, so the first thing is eat real food. So no matter what you want to, I, this, and these are what I tell my clients and what I implement with them, is you want to consume food as close to nature as possible. Um, so if you're starting with real food, you will always have success past that. Um, if you're starting from you know, packaged food and processed food and all that, you're going to have a lot for time. Um, so it's just always go back to eating real food. The second thing is keep it simple. So oh, there's a lot of different recipes and um, just there's literally millions of recipes, keto recipes and all different types of things out there. And it can be overwhelming in itself. So I always say, you know, keep it simple. Um, even for myself, like on a daily basis, I don't really make recipes. Maybe, like I have over 100 recipes in my book, but on a regular basis, I just, you know, choose a protein, pair it with a veggie, and then add a healthy fat. Um, it's as simple as that, and if you're eating whole real foods, you will get very far with that. The next thing is finding your carb limit. So whether you're tracking total carbs, net carbs, or not tracking at all, um, you have to find your carb limit for yourself. So everybody is different. Everybody has their, everybody has different activity levels, different medical history. Um, my carb limit is not going to be the same as each of your carb limits and vice versa. Um, so I would always say if you don't know where to start, like I did in my study, I started at 50 grams total carbs. Start there and titrate up or down depending on how you are doing personally, um, how you're feeling, what your you know, goals are, which I'm gonna go into in the next slide. The next thing is adequate protein. So always, um, in my opinion, protein is very, very important. Um, like I said in my study, 
we didn't, you know, limit protein at all. They, you know, protein and fat fell, fell where it fell as they consumed um, their food. So I always recommend, you know, adequate, high quality protein. You definitely want to um, build your, for, in my opinion, I build my day off protein. So if I'm planning out my day, I put the protein first and make sure that I'm hitting my protein goal within my meals, and then I fill the rest in with fats and carbs. Electrolytes, um, personally, I just consume high quality salt. Um, I think this is the easiest place to start if you're tripped up on like, how many electrolytes should I be consuming? What, like, should I be consuming magnesium, potassium, how much of it? Um, I think that if you, you know, really are getting back to basics, salt is enough, especially if it's a high quality salt that's not super processed because it's still gonna have a lot of the trace minerals in that. Um, and when you're having, when you consume salt, it helps balance out the other electrolytes as well. Um, so making sure you're getting enough salt is the main thing. And then the last kind of tip is consistency over perfection. So I say this all the time, and I tell myself, tell myself all this all the time, that consistency trumps perfection every single time. Like none of us are gonna be perfect all the time. If that's not reality, that's not real life. The main thing is being consistent and trusting the process and realizing that it takes time to see changes. Um, I'm going to say a quote that my friend Ryan said again. He said, uh, your body is an Amazon Prime. It's not going to show up in two days. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, but it's so true. I thought I was like, wow, that is very, very true. Um, so yeah, and then the kind of second part of that is another quote I like, the master has failed more, more times than the beginner has even tried. Mm -hmm. So I have, I'm not saying I'm a master at all. Um, I'm learning every day, just like the rest of us, and, um, but I have failed many times. I've tried, I've gone through these kind of concepts and tried all of these things for myself, and I've failed many times, but I've learned from every single thing. Um, and so I would say that if you're coming into this and you're overwhelmed by so many things, like just pick one thing, go back to basics, start there, and just go, just try. Because if you, if you never try and never try different things, um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna grow and learn from them. But in that as well, you have to, uh, kind of figure out where to start. So the last kind of part of this lecture is I'm going to talk about you know, if you've done all these things and you are trying to try out one of those other concepts, maybe you want to try carnivore or something like that, um, I want you to ask yourself these questions before you even embark on that. So the first thing is, what are my goals? So if you're ever going into, you know, if you want to try something new or, you know, you're going into a, a new nutrition protocol or exercise protocol, you have to know what your goal is. And I would say that it's very important to pick one specific goal at a time, just because that in itself, if you have all these different goals, they can become paralyzing in themselves. So you wanna pick one goal to focus on and at that specific time, and you want it to be specific and realistic. Because if you don't have a goal to work toward, it's a lot harder to kind of get your mindset right and get everything else in order to really you know, reach that goal. Um, so the first thing is ask yourself what your goals are, write them down, pick one to focus on, because that is going to, you know, change what you're doing. So for example, if your goal is, you know, fat loss or weight loss, maybe you need to start tracking macros for a little while to see how much you're consuming. Um, maybe you should be putting a ton of butter and fat in your coffee, depending on what your protocol is. Um, if your goal is performance, maybe you, you can try out you know, a targeted keto diet or a cyclical keto diet and incorporate some carbs in. Um, if your goal is just you, know, you want some more mental clarity or you're trying to treat a neurological issue, maybe you do need to be tracking your ketones you know, every day. You know, if you feel better mentally focused with higher ketone levels and you want to monitor that, and that's your main goal because you want to be productive at your job every day, and that's the main thing and you feel better at a higher level of ketosis, or just knowing that you're in ketosis, maybe you are tracking. Um, the last one is, you know, if you are trying to treat an autoimmune disease, or you're just trying to kind of heal your gut and, you know, give your gut a rest from all the stuff that you're consuming, maybe you want to try carnivore, you know? 
Um, so there's all these different, all of those different 12 concepts, like I want you to go into those with a specific goal in mind so that you can, um, you know, know what you're doing and have something to work towards and that will help you kind of push out all the noise as it comes. The second thing is what can I adhere to for my lifestyle? So whenever you're gonna try something new, yes, you wanna experiment and you wanna, you know, try these different things, but you always wanna have in the back of your mind, what can I adhere to for my lifestyle? Um, so I'll just give you an example. So I tried, you know, I did carnivore for months because I just wanted to experiment with it. And I thought it was a really good experience um, in terms of, you know, helping to heal my gut a little bit. I felt better. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I've always loved vegetables. Like, I love avocados. If anybody knows me, like, my phone case is an avocado. <laughs> um, and so it just wasn't really, like, sustainable for me. Um, and I also love volume, and I, and I love that in my in my diet, and I feel I feel good with it. So I couldn't sustain carnivore for a long period of time because it just didn't fit my lifestyle. So same with things like fasting and you know all of these different concepts that we talked about. Like we want to think about if you really see yourself maintaining these long term. Um, but again, also you you can experiment short term, but just keep that always in the back of your head. What can you adhere to for your lifestyle? Because adherence is one of the biggest things that reasons why people fail is because they cannot adhere to the plan that they've set out for themselves. Um, so just always be thinking of that. And the next thing is, do I have a plan? So a lot of people go into changing their you know nutrition or changing their exercise protocols, but they don't really have a specific plan in place. Um, so I want you to think about that going into this. They don't. You, you want to have a, a short-term plan and also a long-term plan. Um, and so underneath that as well, you want to be tracking your metrics. So this doesn't mean you know just tracking your ketone levels. It means tracking how you're feeling when you're making these changes. So are you sleeping better? You know, are you performing better? Are you you know tracking your body composition not just with a scale? Are you taking measurements and pictures? All of these things are very important so that you can actually implement changes along the way that are legitimate and that help you reach your goal faster. If you're not tracking these things, you're gonna be just kind of going in blind and making all of these changes and not knowing what's working and what's not working. So you always wanna track your metrics and you wanna invest in yourself. So having a plan, adhering to these things, knowing your goals, um, a lot of people, and this is for me as well, um, I, I invested in my own nutrition coach and business coach recently um, in the last year, and it's been a humongous change, game changer for me. At first, I, you know, I said to myself, I'm a nutritionist myself, like I know what I should be doing. I don't need to hire someone to, you know, tell me these things. And I came to like an epiphany, and I was just like, well, if I really have a goal that I'm that I'm particular about, and I really am serious about reaching that, like I'm gonna invest in myself. And I'm gonna, you know, hire someone to keep me accountable and to bounce ideas off of. And if you think about it, like the most elite athletes in the world, the most like amazing business people in the world, they all have their own coaches and they all have their own mentors. So there's nothing wrong with, you know, investing in yourself and seeking help because I promise you it makes the biggest difference in the world. And the last thing is looking at everything else. So Besides your nutrition and your exercise, well, your nutrition, you want to look at all of these other things because all of these things, your mindset, your sleep, your stress levels, your activity levels, uh, your recovery, they all play into reaching your goal and ultimately finding success because everything is connected. I do believe nutrition is the most important part of it, so what you're putting in your body is probably the main component, but they, it all lines up with all of these things. So these are things that you want to be tracking in your metrics so that you can make changes to get you closer to your goal. And they all matter. So I don't make the rules. Nobody presenting here makes the rules. We're all still learning. This keto is still very new. Um, this research world is still very new. We don't know the answers. So I don't make the rules, you guys make the rules for yourself. Everybody is their own individual and you just need to know that and follow kind of these concepts and hopefully they will help you to 
um, get closer to whatever your goal is. And I just want to end on uh, one thing. So being here at KudoCon um, and just over the years, I really, um, I keep coming back because this community is just so amazing. Um, everybody is here, everybody, every single person in these pictures are here to make a difference um, and to just help people. And although we all have our own kind of way of doing things, we all um, have our own opinions and our own research and all that, we are all still here to make a bigger difference in the entire world and to get people healthy, healthy and help people. And that is the reason why I love this community so much. And this is just a quote that I, when I hear this quote or see it, it reminds me of this community. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I think that just encompasses all of what we are trying to do here. Um, all the presenters, everybody here, is that we're just trying to you know, get people healthier. Um, we all have kind of our own our own concepts and our own businesses and all of that, but we're trying to overall just help people. So um, yeah, thank you guys for listening.